Good afternoon students and today it is time after a long period of uh, preparation for class board 10th standard social science as already you know that social science uh, with a huge subject level and expansion of 21 topics right. So, and this 21 topics this throughout the year so a lot of struggle we were teaching and you people learning right the process of teaching and learning process it was wonderful really and we come to an end with a wonderful exam and I believe all the students are very much delighted so in writing the question paper and wonderful answers right and all the levels really I feel so after wonderfully you are prepared so you feel like this question paper so today what we are going to discuss you feel very comfortable isn't it and is there there are two three areas of little so like twists or something like so even still the students were very very comfortable in tackling those questions so let us so go forward so the questions that we have here that one after the other as you know the social science the question paper is for 80 marks and in which we have 37 questions in all and in which the part one uh, like section A, A, B, C, D, E we have in which the first section is of 20 MCQs that, I'm, that will so, uh, check ourselves that as yes, this is what you see on the screen the instructions for the examination all the general instructions you might have read very clearly all the general instructions and as per that you are written all the questions the total questions are from 1 to total 37 so 1 to 37 questions 37 is the last map pointing in which now first we are going to look into the objective part section A it is of 20 questions so now this is the first question in which which of the following countries or the regions participation of women in public life is highest so as we all studied so well and prepared so well out of this so a b c d nordic countries arab states european countries asian countries then all this for a b c d the priority of the option is nordic countries as we all know that the nordic countries always gave high priority to the women life even in the public and private right and in the political life right the women participation is very very high understand so that is why the answer goes to option b sorry option a nordic countries the next second question is of match the following so here you could see the very clearly you could match the uh, question it is almost based on the three sets like uh, we have the federalism lesson in which the power has been divided between central and state understand and in which so we have union list state list and concurrent list and finally we also we have some residuary subjects now we need to compare or so match this set with column 2 and now the first union list in which banking is very very important understand now banking one is uh, related to three and state list agriculture agriculture is one of the important item of the state list right so the next concurrent list we have here concurrent list education both center and state so they make laws so in this education that's why it goes to concurrent list education 3 4 and the residuary subject that is not a, none other than computer software the computer software is recently developed it is not added in any of the sets like uh, lists of union state or the concurrent that is why it comes under residuary subject now the answer goes to union list 1 is connected with 3 1 3 2 1 3 4 4 2 the answer is A the second question the answer is A and coming to the third question which of the following is an example of coming together federations there are two varieties of federations as two forms of federations coming together federations and holding together federations 
Now coming together federations, they come together to have so greater strength, right, and unity, and uh, they prove themselves very powerful. So now USA is of so combination of 50 states come together. So to create bigger unit. So independent states come together and form a bigger unit. So now USA is the best example for coming together federation, whereas India, Belgium, and Spain, they are the holding together federations. The answer for the question number three is B. It's not C, it's B, USA, right? The next. There are two statements given. So this is assertion and reason type of question, two statements. The first statement is talking about, that is assertion A is talking about Belgium. And as we know very well, the Belgium and its constitution was amended for four times. It was amended for four times. So to bring a so lot of uh, unity or the adjustment, accommodation of the social the diversities or the social divisions. So it was amended for four times, right? And coming to the uh, reason, so these amendments were to enable everyone to live together because so there were regions, different regions and including the capital city Brussels, right? So, and even so there were the people speaking Dutch, French and German speaking. So and we know all everything with including percentages and there was a conflict between these uh, groups, the social groups then. So to bring all these social groups to live together enable them to live together, the constitution was amended for four times. There is a reason here, what you see is that assertion and reason, both are interrelated. And the reason is explaining the assertion very clearly, isn't it? Because this was done and this was happening, right? So it's very clearly where we can go for, so A is the right answer, what is A? So both assertion A and reason are both are true and the reason is the correct explanation of assertion A. So this is what the answer is A for this. And next we go for question number 5. Question number 5 is of again so match the two columns. The column 1 is about so few of the Indian port cities or the ports, port trusts of India, major ports. And the other side, so what kind of and what type of port it is. So when you see Kandla, so this is the port which was developed immediately after independence, Indian independence because we lost Karachi port to Pakistan and immediately we require a port to immediately connect the trade between the Middle East. So this was a greater importance. So immediately we established a, a port in so Gujarat, that's a Kandla, Gujarat coast. Then coming to Mumbai is the biggest and the largest in any sense you can take. So that is biggest in like uh, handling, cargo handling or business trade and even hinters, right? Everything, so it's the biggest port. So Mumbai, so two is three. Then Vishakapatnam is the deepest, so landlocked. So it's a natural harbor. It has a natural harbor and the deepest landlocked port that is Vishakapatnam and Kolkata is a riverine port as we all know that 138 kilometers inside so from the coast so because it is constructed it was constructed by the British during the British and so it had a great trade so we all know that Bengal region and its importance and British had greatest trade so there in so West Bengal, that Bengal region, so it was constructed on river, 138 kilometers inside on the river it was constructed. And now today you now see the match, one Kandla is of 4, 1, 4, Mumbai 3, 2, 3, Vishakapatnam 2, 3, 2 and 4 Kolkata, it's river in port. Now the answer is A. The answer is A. Then next we go for next question. There are two statements given. There are two statements given. Again, assertion and reason. So one more question. Already the sixth question, this is a sixth question and fourth question was one of the assertion and reason. Now, in which agriculture and industry, it's a talking about the relation between agriculture and industry. Both are hand in hand. So due to agriculture, 
industry develops because it needs to produce many things which are required by the agricultural sector. And at the same time, when agriculture sector is uh, improving, right? So industry expands. Understand? And many products produced machinery and many, so which helpful for the agriculture to expand. So both are hand in hand. There is a reason you can see. So the statement A assertion is true. And coming to statement uh, reason, reason R. So industrial development is a so precondition for eradication of unemployment. So now these two statements uh, have no much of the relation. But both the statements are true. There is no mistake in that. So there is no doubt in that. So both the statements assertion and reason both are true. But the second statement is only talking about industrial development. But it is not related to agriculture. Is it clear? So there is a reason. So we go for option B. B is the right answer. Both assertion and reason are true. But so R is not the correct explanation of assertion A, right? So this is what for question number six answer is B. And coming to question number seven, once again, which one of the following soils develop an area with high temperature, high temperature and heavy rainfall? High temperature and heavy rainfall. So now here in which if you see the, there are four options red and yellow soils, black soils, alluvial soils and laterite soils. As already we know how these first A, B, C are formed. The first one red and yellow soils are formed because of the so disintegration of crystalline so rocks. right? So, and the second one is of black soils formed because of the so solidification of lava and then soils are formed, isn't it? And so the next alluvial soils formed because of the deposition of the rivers. So, and the last and final laterite soils are formed. So, with the reason of two, two, the spells of two spells like one spell is of high temperatures, understand? And the second spell is of heavy rainfall. So, the combination of accompanied by high temperature is accompanied by in the next spell heavy rainfall, then leaching process takes place. The soil, it has leached away the total nutrients. So this is answer is D. So which of the following soil develops with high temperature and so heavy rainfall? The answer is D. Laterite soils. The next question. So this is a picture. You, we have to identify the picture, and this is a picture of. We have to identify from which of the four options, right? Which is the right answer? So the first one is Raja Ram Mohan Rai. So can you? Relate Raja Rao Mohan Rai with this picture? No. And Raja Ravi Verma, who was a most famous known painter, so then, so you cannot write. And here Gangadhar Bhattacharya also is not. And then the right answer is so Lakshmi Nath so Bej Barwa. Lakshmi Nath Bej Barwa. So he is the one, so we have to identify in the picture as we know very well. He is very famous for. Assamese literature. He is very famous for Assamese literature and he was uh, yes, glorifying his most important uh, the works were the grandma's tales. Grandma's tales. So then the answer for question number 8 is C. Lakshminath Bej Barwa. And the next question is here. Question number 9. In which one of the following countries? In which one of the following countries was Mass production, in which one of the following was mass production an important feature in the 1920s? Once again the question, in which one of the following countries was mass production an important feature in 1920s? So the early 1920s, there was one of the feature you could see in United States of America, where so they decided to go for mass production as on the way. So the mass production of cars were taken place. The Ford industry was started. Yes, as we know. So there is a reason. Now out of the four ABCD, 
So Poland, Japan, France, we cannot take as the right answer. Then A, United States of America. So in the early 19th centuries, they concentrated towards the mass production and they started for manufacturing industry, car, automobile manufacturing industry. So the answer is A. Then we go for question number 10. Choose the correct option from the following regarding central powers in the first world war. So choose the correct option following central powers. As we know, so in the first world war, we have two major groups. So one, it was allied forces. Allied forces were the combination of so UK, that is England. So then France, Russia, so America, isn't it? These are the other countries. <coughs> As so mainly we could see Britain, France, Russia, like countries were the allied forces. But as what is here asked, the central powers. The central powers here in, uh, in, the period, in this first world war, what we see, the central powers. Just a moment. Yes. Yeah. The central powers, if you see here, right. The central powers here, Germany. So Germany, a central power. So then Austria, Hungary. Germany. Okay. So Germany, Austria, Hungary and Ottoman Turkey, the three so, uh, countries are the part of central powers. So, the answer for this central powers in the first world war is A. So, the right answer is A. Then, then next question is here that which one of the following ideologies were the European governments driven by after the defeat of Napoleon 1815? As we all know that Napoleon Bonaparte, so he, he tried to bring a kind of new principles, democratic ways of uh, aligning the countries and he tried to conquer most countries of Europe and as on the way as he launched Napoleonic code and so most of the other countries in Europe they believed so that Napoleon is going to bring democracy and many other changes and against uh, like dict uh, dictatorial like against uh, uh, monarchical governments at this moment you know so Napoleon brought many changes. He changed the map of Europe. But after Napoleon was defeated in 1815 in the Battle of Waterloo, so once again, so the European powers gathered at uh, this Congress of Vienna, headed by so Metternich, and where in which they brought up conservatism. They brought up conservatism once again. They brought up conservatism once again. So, there's, so, socialism we cannot, so conservatism we can, conservatism, I just, I refresh my dear students, yes, yeah. I go for a slide, so once again, right, yes, and so now you can see conservatism, so what is conservatism if you see here, so that Conservatism is nothing but so preserve all the old order, preserve the old order. So it was disturbed by Napoleon, isn't it? So we can go for the item conservatism, so liberalism, romanticism, socialism, all these were not related to this question. So the answer is B. The clear answer is question number 11 is B. And next, so which one of the following is a challenge of globalization? Here the question number 12 is asking about globalization and its, <coughs> excuse me, challenges. So where in the, see the options, so I'll try to find out and help you out in getting the answer of this for given. So access to new markets. Yes, when globalization, it's process of interlinking the markets. So on the way of interlinking the markets and the economies, so 
uh, globalization was successful in access to new markets. And the second option, access to new talent. Yes, so when globalization was introduced, so new ways of this are present today, what we see the IT, all that industries, right? So definitely, so they were so really giving a chances for the new talents. It's not only in IT or something like in every area, in, in whatever we have the sectors aware. So the new talents been encouraged very, very clearly so by this globalization. And so international recruitment, as you could see today, people are very, very frequently moving from one country to another country. So on the name of education, on the name of employment, so everywhere, so there's a greater movement due to this recruitment, international recruitment. So as far as we discussed, access to markets is correct. And then access to new talent is correct. And the international recruitment is also correct. But one hour coming to the option D, disproportionate growth. As we all the developing countries, the most of the developing countries today, so in WTO, so we are fighting for the fairer globalization. The reason behind why fairer globalization is expected and demanded by most of the developing countries because on the name of neo-colonialism and even WTO, he is not pressurizing the developed countries. So kind of uh, the concessions for them, but demanding all the uh, developing countries to so liberalize their policies so that all the huge amenities can come, come to developing countries and then exploit all the resources. Isn't it? There are advantages and uh, so disadvantages, but in this area, there is a disproportionate growth. So where you see, based on this globalization, most developed countries are getting greater advantage and even the developing countries and the poorer countries are also getting advantage but when comparatively so the the developed nations are taking more stake in that there's a reason we are fighting for the so fairer globalization so there is no disproportionate growth for all the economies so that is the fight today and demand today that's the reason so a challenge for globalization is to provide this pro proportionate growth. So this is a big challenge for so, globalization. So answer for question number 12 is D. The next question I would like to go for question number 13. Which one of the following categories of urban households take, please try to understand the question very, very clearly. So every part of the question you need to read and understand very clearly. So the categories of urban households. So, so it is all about urban households, right? First point. And the second one is that highest percentage of loans. Highest percentage of loans, right? And the third point is that from formal sector. So you have to consider one, two, three levels. The first one. So most of the categories of urban households take the highest percentage of loans from formal sector. If you misunderstand as informal sector, then you make a mistake. Then if you misunderstand as instead of urban to rural, you make a mistake. The highest and lowest, if you misunderstand, you lose a mark. Understand? So now in considering one, two, three here, you know, so then poor households, no, they are not in the formal. As we know very well, there are many problems in getting loans for the poor households. Mo most importantly, the lack of collateral. Then, so well off. Then the second one is that households with few assets. So these people are also not getting many. Understand? So then, well off households, but they are doing well. But finally, so this is also we cannot consider. But we can consider rich households. You know, the rich households is the right answer so because 90% of the loans, the highest percentage are asking. So in the pay in the, in the textbook, it, this concept has been explained through pie diagrams, four pie diagrams given in the textbook in which this rich households, 90%, you know, they are taking 
90 percent the highest percentage 90 whereas well of households they could able to get loans up to 85 percent only 80 to 85 percent but rich households so because they have all they know the all the procedures they have collaterals and so they could perform even so the procedures and everything they could easily follow there's a reason rich households could achieve 90 percent of the so, urban household so, uh, loans so in the urban areas from formal sector from all the commercial banks and many other right so the answer is d the so question number 13 the answer is d so we have to eliminate a b and c the answer is d and next we have the question number 14 which one of the following is the modern forms of currency right so it's really you know children so today so what the questions we have seen are most comfortable for us right after we preparing for such a long time here yeah, really so very much delighted we people are right, to attempt such type of questions so which of the following is a modern form of currency paper notes gold coins silver coins copper coins as we all know very well that so there's gold coins so copper coins and the silver coins so these were widely used so during the so ancient times or so the when so we had greater kingdoms right most of the time in the ancient and the medieval even sometime isn't it so we used but when we come to the modern age the paper notes become the most important one right so the answer for this question is paper notes answer a 14 answer a then we go for the next one then the next one is 15 question number 15 which one of the following is a feature of the unorganized sector organized unorganized it's very very clear so the all the units with all following all the kinds of uh, the employment regularly and all the benefits to the workers you know they are not the scattered units so large scale units so with all so the technology or investments and the rules and regulations stipulated by the governments so they follow very very strictly in which organized sector so the people really the workers enjoy every benefits I understand so most systematic organized sector but the question is all about unorganized sector of Indian economy so when you talk about unorgan unorganized sector of the Indian economy right so where unorganized sector of the Indian economy so terms of employment are regular the question so the first option is a terms of an employment is not regular so it that is very irregular understand so there is no permanent employment like a, like a appointment letter so and the timings and are not uh, so perfect or what is that not accurate and even so many other features are not regular there's a reason terms of employment are regular is a wrong one unorganized sector then you compare with the unorganized sector yes okay so uh, dear students are you getting my voice is that am I, am I audible to you all is that am I audible to you all so some children are you know, Harsha Bardhan Mishra so no sound you are saying then what does it mean what is no sound is that my voice is not audible to you no it's fast right it's good audible right very good so then so which one of the following feature of the unorganized sector so is the feature right the people have assured work this is wrong so there is no assurance of work so whenever there is a chance whenever there is a time right when uh, heavy orders and all then people will be called when there are no works and all and people will be rejected or so uh, given a pause of uh, their work there is a reason there is no assured work they have some formal processes and procedures see this unorganized sector never follows this processes never 
never follows the procedures of the governments so never follows the labor laws like like you can see the labor so laws like so never never they follow understand so like the process and so proceedings so they do not follow formally so most informal we could use the informal processes they follow then next there are rules and regulations but not followed this is true in the case of unorganized sector so there are many rules and regulations set by the government but they do not follow yes this is the most so related answer here so the answer for the question number 15 is d then students are you following yes i, I feel like i'm so happy and uh, i'm trying to give you all the answers very correct right and there are no uh, uh, contradictions with anybody here and everybody is so happy and i'll be trying to give you much more and much details about all the other questions like now the question number so 16 is here question number so 16 natural products being changed into other forms is known as as we have the uh, three sectors primary sector secondary sector and the tertiary sector the primary sector in which all the natural products are utilized and so and they produce something isn't it so they do not change their form but whereas it comes to the next level a kind of processing is done a kind of processing take for example primary sector so we take the fish understand so directly we are obtaining fish from the sea and uh, any other water bodies and so we use we use land and uh, so producing the agriculture the many products we are producing so this is primary sector so when it comes to the secondary sector so we take the products from the primary and we make some change a process of manufacturing is takes place there and if we change the form and we change the form to much valuable product so an end product we make that's what here in the question natural products have been taken and they are being changed into other forms is known as you know this is the area so you need to check here that changed into other forms is the most important area changed into other forms so this is done in the secondary pro pro secondary production you know it's a secondary product when a natural product is processed and changed its form and it turns to into secondary product but it is not a quaternary product or it's not a service product tertiary product and definitely it's not a primary product understand so the answer for the question number 16 is b the next the next question here somebody is asking me to go little faster and which one of the following states is ruled by a regional party so here we have the party so states you can see haryana madhya pradesh rajasthan and so today you see the most importantly for long time you i can go for so this is the area i go for right yes biju janata dal biju janata dal right and here navin patnaik for a long time right more than 15 years i believe right uh, he is the chief minister right navin patnaik so biju janata dal biju janata dal yes he is a leading party regional party in orissa for a long time in orissa right so now i go for the answer 17 instead of haryana madhya pradesh rajasthan i go for orissa So the Biju Janata Dal is a right answer. Seventeen answer. C. The next eighteen. Which one of the following countries adopted multi-party system here? So you can see USA is following two-party system. United Kingdom is following two-party system. China is following one-party system. And only India is the right answer is here. here. That India is following multi-party system, right? So the so the answer is here. The question number eighteen. The answer is B. And next we go for nineteen. Choose the correct option to fill the blank for comparing countries. 
So dash is considered is one of the most important attributes by the World Bank. Now you have to consider World Bank. So World Bank has divided the countries based on so rich income countries or the high income countries, middle income countries and the low income countries. It is based on so per capita income as we already we discussed and we you people studied as we know. So out of that per capita income and when you see the income, right, this is what? It's not the living standard, it's not the health status, it is not the education. So when this education, health status and living standard, these three are considered, then it is HDI, okay, Human Development Index. So And so I go for with the World Bank, which considers, dash it considers to compare the countries is income. So answer for question number 19 is C. Then question number 20, last and final, we have this table here. This is the table. So this table is given from textbook. And so listen, this is all about uh, the comparison of countries in, G in this HDI. And it is of 2019 report. India and its neighboring countries are here, are being uh, discussed and uh, compared. In all which if you see the question related to this table, so the question is, which of the following countries has the highest level of human development index? In which? So then all this India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Nepal, where you see which country has the lowest rank, the rank, the number, this is all the, it's not number is lowest, but uh, it is highest. When the number is low and its development is highest my dear children right its development is highest so now the answer right answer is sri lanka so which of the following countries has the highest level of human development index human development index that is the answer is sri lanka so the answer for question number 20 is c so this is what about all the 1 to 20 questions my dear children so very much comfortable i believe that there is no difficulty much of the difficulty in most of the questions right even assertion and reason we have two questions and some of the questions where it's a little bit of that right to so uh, create little difficulty but so where the, all the people, most children, we prepared so well. So there's one to 20 questions. So I believe, so very, very much comfortable for almost all the children. And any other doubts or questions regarding that, we'll be looking into. Then now I move on to the next section. Section B, yes, this is of, so two mark questions. This is of two mark questions where we have the number of two mark questions in which the first question is 21, question number 21. Why did the feeling of alienation increase among Sri Lankan Tamils? As in 1956, what was happened, we all knew that. So uh, there was an act passed by, you know, the Sri Lankan government. It was a democratically formed government. As it tried to so implement the, you know, majority Aryanism in 1956, it brought an act. As per that brought, uh, act, we passed. So it made, it highlighted the Sinhala people, language people, you know. So Sinhala was made an official, official language and the priority was given Sinhala in Sri Lanka. And you know, the official language, it was become the, Sinhala become the official language of Sri Lanka. So the rest of the other people like, we have the Tamils especially. So they lost their so right here in Sri Lanka with this. So with this, they started feeling alienated. Understand? And the second point is that, so uh, there was a preference. So in the government policies and in the education or in the job priorities, their preference was given to the Sinhalas, but not the Tamils. So with that, Tamils were feeling alienated. And finally, so we have a thing that, so Buddhism the religion based because in Sri Lanka so even the Buddhism was the major religion and next so there were Muslims Christians understand so but so what they made as per this act of 1956 so they made Buddhism to foster in the country and with this the rest of the religious people especially Tamils right so there were the most Hindus and the Muslims were also there and they felt like alienated and the next the citizenship, right? So the denial of citizenship to 
this Tamils in the state was done by the Sri Lankans 1956 act with this. So these are the four important points we need to write as per the 1956 act where all this Tamils the feel like alienated after 1956 so in the in Sri Lanka and as it resulted in so civil war and all uh, further so there was a lot of destruction in Sri Lankan democratic system. And next question is here that the question number 22, two mark question, explain any two causes of depletion of forest during the colonial period in India. In India, the depletion of colonial uh, areas, if you see, the expansion of railways is the most important one, you know, the railways were expanded so by the British it is not for the development of India as we all know very well that so for the greedy trade ends of the British for better and trade and better control of the regions different regions right mostly for trade the railways was expanded is one of the most important reason for the depletion of forests in India and secondly there was a comma agriculture as agriculture was expanded agriculture was expanded yes in which commercial so as we know the commercial so agriculture was very much expanded and most of the lands were under the local communities and the local farmers so the most of the areas so they were converted towards commercial agriculture and already we know that the plantations so they developed so plantations in India most parts and also a kind of a uh, scientific forestry was developed but here the mostly the development of agriculture railways and even in the commercially plantations these are all the reasons you know between 1951 and 1980 according to the forest survey of india 26200 square kilometers of forest area was converted into agricultural land in india once again, so 22, 26,200 square kilometers of area uh, under forest was converted so, into uh, agricultural land and even substantial parts of the tribal belts, especially northeastern and central India in many parts, you know, there's shifting cultivation which was there. That was also one of the reason for the damaging of this depletion of forest cover many of the local communities in these areas so they were following so there's slash and burning method of agriculture one of the reason for the depletion of forests in india so these are all these reasons so during the british during the so british it was happened my dear students so these are the three major points you could write that is first one is expansion of the railways and how the land was converted towards agriculture and even the so commercialization of and scientific forestry was brought up this also brought many of the forests come down and also one of the reason locally many of the communities following slash and burn agriculture so these three points support this question and next we go for question number 23 analyze the role of chief minister Kant Camilo cover who led the moment to unite the regions of Italy and next or examine the ideas of liberal nationalism in Europe during 19th century the two questions so this is an internal choice in the question number 23 either this or this you can write so first we see so mr. Uh, how could we analyze the conditions of the the chief minister cover as uh, you know very well the chief minister cover so he was nor a democrat or a nor nor a revolutionary you know he, he was not a revolutionary nor a democratic and he became the chief minister of italy and took the uh, responsibility because he was the central person of the unification of U uh, italy so till the you know total unification can be done in or checked in five levels but you know first level second level third level up to where this cover was alive but most dramatically you know the after the third level of unification he was died and then later part as we know very well the king victor manuel and and how garibaldi helped so in unification of germany in italy yes 
So, the, so but the role of Mr. Chief Minister cover was very very important in two cases you know. So, a tactful diplomatic alliance was made with France. He made a tactful diplomatic alliance with France. So, Franca Villa was one of the conference and it was engineered very wonderful by cover so, for the unification of uh, so Italy and the second one Sardinia Piedmont succeeded in defeating Austrian forces in 1859. So, these were the two most important levels of the unification in which the cover's role was very much important. So, in this way, so we could give, so who, who was Kavur and he was not a diplomat or he was not a revolutionary. So, but as become the prime minister, he become the central, central figure of the unification and the two cases like so tactful alliance with France was one of the most diplomatic work by the Kavur for the unification and even Sardinia Piedmont won the war against Austria in 19, 1859. So, the up to where she was wonderful and successful. Then they say next question is all about the ideas of liberalism as you know very well liberalism. So, liber so is a word so which has which means freedom right. So, free. So, in middle classes liberalism is yes, in the middle classes what for this liberalism stood? This liberalism stood for the individual and equality before law. For every individual, it stood for the equality before law. As liberalism is very, very, it was so important, you know, politically, it emphasized the concept of government by consent. You know, what do you mean by consent? Consent is nothing but deliberation and discussion and so taking the, the opinions of the people. So, this is what is that. So, liberalism stood for this kind of consent, the people's con consent, consultation, discussion, deliberation, right, this was. And so, during the French Revolution, what was happened, all you know very well, that liberalism had stood for the end of autocracy and clerical privileges. Liberalism stood for autocracy and liberal, so yes, uh, principles like clerical privileges were ended. In 19th century, liberals also stressed the inviolability of the private property and uh, they stressed and because till that period most of the properties, lands, whatever of the country were under the control of the king or as already we discussed the clergy and nobility had greater control, understand? And the common people, so they never had any properties. They used to enjoy 90-95% you know, of the population of the common people used to have few like 5%, 4%, 3% of the resources of a country in their hand. So, with that they were facing many problems by the more than that they, they were paying many taxes to the first and second estates as we know very well in the case of France. So, there is a reason the liberals what they said you know there is an important for private property. Each and every individual could acquire some private property. So, in this way, so we could explain even the economy in the economic sphere, also we could explain that. So, freedom of the markets, the liberalism stood for the freedom of the markets and abolition of the state imposed taxes, like you know, the customs duties or many other, right? So, these are all so this kind of answer we have to produce for liberalism. So, during <coughs> 19th century, you can write liberalism and social liberalism, political liberalism and economic liberalism, right? And the next question is here that 23, question number 23 and yes, question number 23, analyze the role of chief, min sorry, this is 23 and I go for next question. Question number 24, differentiate between formal and informal sources of loans. Now, you see here formal sources of loans first, formal and the second was informal sources of credit. So, what are the formal sources of credit? So, like all the commercial banks and all the so institutions, financial institutions runs based under or uh, run under the control of RBI and government's control like if we have the chit fund companies might be or even insurance companies might be right and all the commercial banks. 
so which, which comes under formal sector and then coming to the informal sources of credit so we have the money lenders traders merchants relatives friends so these are all comes under so this sources of uh, yes informal sources of credit and these sources of credit you know so this is very clear by formal sources of credit so it is under rbi it is regulated under rbi but so it is informal is not understand and the next question is that so rate of interest rate of so interest the percentage is low but the rate of interest here in informal sector of sources is very high there is the land owners or the money lenders they collect huge rate of interest understand and these formal sectors like banks they follow all the procedures formal procedures as we discussed like organized this is right and most of the formal sectors they follow all the rules and regulations and procedures so stipulated by rbi and given the government but now the informal so never they do not follow all that and already i gave the examples commercial banks and all the financial institutions cooperative societies come under formal sector and informal sector of so the sources of loans are the most importantly money lenders traders merchants and also relatives friends and many other right so this is what is all about question number so 24 my dear children then now we go for question number 25 examine the rising importance of the tertiary sector in india so when you talk about the there is a shift of sectors in growth and development of the any economy as primary sector was dominating the next secondary sector so started developing and finally now in any any of the economy the most of the economies of the world so with the developed and even in the developing countries like india this so tertiary sector is dominating why it is and so if you see there are four important points are the most important points like the first is so what plays major role and okay? income when there is a development you know so there is industrialization industrialization so then modernization modernization when industrialization brought up so it brought modernization so under which so urbanization was taken up mostly isn't it so because of all these reasons right so there was a lot of uh, the development for the economies when the economies are growing the economies are so with a lot of growth rapid growth nowadays you could see so the income of the people uh, is increasing when the income is increasing because employment is expanding and income is increasing and varieties of you know services they are produced and in which huge generation of employment and income and this demands you know the purchasing power of the people is increasing now when the people purchasing power and you know the economy is slowly growing everybody they require or they expect better services once upon a time most children in india they were going to the government schools but today and most children are going to the private schools and only the government hospitals used to serve the people of india earlier so much long back you in know, years ago and now so most of the people even so you afford or not so we can go we are going for private sector private hospitals like in any area you see so there are the wonderful you know the so great services are demanded so we want you know so like hospitals greater hospitals we require multi speciality hospitals are required by the people right and educational institutions in different areas and different levels and and the postal and telegraph services expanded and this computer services expanded it sector and even banking sector atms and even online transactions pos purchases police stations courts uh, whatever wherever you go malls and markets so this all these areas so people are expecting more and more services my dear children 
So because of this reason, so this the service sector is becoming more and more um, uh, greater and important, and it's rising. Its importance is rising in the economy. So that is all because of these reasons I has already discussed. And so also we could say that so when you see the pri primary sector and secondary sector, especially agriculture, the sector of agriculture and industry, they are fast developing. Understand? So though GDP percentage is reducing, so from the case of primary sector, the share of GDP is reducing, but so the agriculture and its production year by year we are increasing. Isn't it? From 1960s, if you check in India, the pro overall production of the all products in India, agriculture products in India, increased in millions of uh, tons. Understand? So, quintals or millions of tons, there is a huge increase. So, when agriculture is expanding and modern ways of agriculture we are expanding and the latest technologies we are bringing into agriculture and also there is a huge expansion of industry, industrial sector with large scale, so medium scale and even many of the small scale industries. See in all these areas you know, so this service sector importance is there. So when there is no service sector, so like supply of raw materials, supply of machinery, supply of technology might be, so whatever, so and even communication, transportation in all that areas, service sector has to support the development of primary and secondary, understand? And even so wherever the agriculture sector is expanding and industry is expanding, there is a need for roads, railways, banking sector, insurance and all the rest of the services are also increasing. So because of this reason, so if the primary, secondary are expanding and automatically tertiary sector is supporting them and even it is expanding very rapidly. Understand? And even the certain services today, the most of the most important services like information and communication are, have become so essential for, for the people today. See, everybody is using cell phone today, right? It is not just using for cell phone for something like, you know. So it is a part of communication. It's all a part of communication. How faster today the total globe has become a small village with this greater communication and uh, so this kind of information technology development and all. These are all the reasons so for the faster growth of our importance for the tertiary sector in any of the economy, my dear children. And coming to the question number 26, my dear. Question number 26. Analyze any three ways to conserve energy resources. Here it's not, a, this is a lesson geography chapter 5 and it's not mineral resources, conservation of energy resources. How we can do it? Analyze any three ways. So presently as India, you know very well. So presently India is in the, and in the efficiency, energy efficiency, we are in the least. So and we are unable to produce. So at the expected levels of energy in the country. So we have many uh, like power projects like uh, we have multi-purpose projects and many other ways of production. Even we have a huge chance for producing solar energy, right, nuclear energy. So but still, so the production is not up to the level, isn't it? It's not that so great and efficient even. So even at the same time production is not that high and also uh, consumption is also very high. So we are not efficiently utilizing the energy in India, we could say that. So then we have to be so cautious about this. We have to be very judicious about this. So then only we could conserve the resources. So for example, like, so using public transportation and the most people in India and especially urban centers, so we are using our personal vehicles like personal bikes, personal cars. But so very less people use so trains and buses, the public transportation, which is available so in the country. So if we switch on to this public transportation and we could reduce carbon monoxides, so which is released by the so bikes, cars and all these automobiles. So this is what one we could do. And even so we could use electric and hybrid vehicles. Today most of the companies are looking towards, most of the automobiles are looking towards electric cars, electric bikes, electric so scooters, right? 
this is what is a one of the most wonderful option for the people that if you want to become a part of this conservation of energy understand so you stop using all this so fuel based like what uh, like uh, petrol and diesel based so vehicles you leave and you can go for electric cars electric bikes and scooters so that we could save energy right so efficiency is very high understand a fuel like a diesel is of more than 100 rupees and it gives us so very limited kilometers of run for a car whereas so it's 100 rupees we spend and go for 15 kilometers and for the same 15 kilometers within a matter of just 10 rupees 15 rupees so we could so run the same so that the same kilometers of area so for this kilometers by an electric car so in this way we could save our energy but what is that real saving of the energy through this car you know? always you can use solar so use solar it's not that directly you charge with a point understand at home or outside because this energy is generated so by mostly thermal we are using coal for that so instead of that even also we are producing through so hydel energy or many other tidal energy or many other so but here if you go for the solar energy you are arranging something at, at your home that solar system and everything so this uh, photovoltaic energy is better for our cars so that so we could uh, reduce so emission of uh, all these waste and uh, carbon monoxides completely and we could save energy understand and then power saving devices you use at home and switch off the electricity electricity like switches fans and say acs or whatever whenever you are not required so we use all these nowadays it's a big passion of using all these right so status symbol like that we could reduce so heavy lighting at home right we could so minimize using all that and mostly we use for non conventional energy resources so using conventional we reduce and go for non conventional like so nuclear and solar that is better like even so gobar gas right all that if we use more and more it's more efficient and that is the reason finally we could say energy saved is energy produced energy saved is energy produced my dear this is about all this question 26 now coming to question number 27 suggest any three ways to enhance political participation of women in india what the indian government and what the india or we people of india can do so or the total system of this political uh, uh, electoral com competition this electoral system can do for the increase on in participation of the women in india so firstly we can see and how we en enhance first and foremost what i say is here that so that so here you see literacy the percentage of literacy even as far as 2001 2011 the literacy levels if you see so and in which so the male literacy is very high and female literacy is low understand so due to this literacy low literacy level especially if you see in the rural areas and the remote areas understand so this literacy levels are still less in women especially understand so when the first of all we need to concentrate what is the root grassroot level so we need to see that the grassroot level if you stretch and you make some measures like specially so literacy is improved so then definitely the greater awareness created in women understand so they start competing nowadays you know all most of the literary liter, uh, literated women so they compete everywhere and most of the toppers in IAS and many other examinations women today isn't it because that, that is literacy so that is greater awareness their need for the society we need to empower them so to empower them so first and foremost you give them literacy so that so their role is enhanced in every participation and socially their role is improved and economically improved and most importantly political participation of the women improves understand this is what is the first point and then so reservation of the seats as already we discussed that so as in the areas of uh, like we have uh, the areas like uh, local self governments local self governments 
33 percentage of the women reservation we could see very clearly it's all about the amendment 73 and 74 right in 1992 the local self governments been asked to give 33 percentage of reservation and because of this you see lakhs of women participating in the local bodies but this is not done in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. In Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, so there is no much of the women representation. As far as considered latest 2019 elections, so this percentage of women participation so is all about so 14% and around. Isn't it? And much before if you see it never crossed 12%. But recently there is a little improvement. But where is 33% when compared with the local self-governments and Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha? Because there is no clear legislation so far. This 33% of the women bill for a long time, for many years is pending in Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha. Understand? There is a reason. So there is no proper reservation. This must be implemented first. We want more and greater political participation of the women. So then increase their percentage. It's now even you can we can increase from 33 to 50 percent because men and women both are same, isn't it? There is no gender bias. Understand? In that case, it could be local self governments can be done with 50 percent, and so Lok Sabha, Raj Sabha, at least so we make it 33 percent immediately so that this political participation of the women increases. Then legally binding, so a fair proportion of women in elected bodies. Then what we can do with this, we can do. So the reservation for the women, legally we can bound the women participating more and more into the legislative councils of the states and the Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha and political parties, they have to play a greater role. And most of the, you know, as in India, we, you know very well, the political leaders, the leader of the political party, so allot seats for so different cases. In most cases, not different cases, in most cases in India. Understand? So in this multi-party system, if women are given this chance by the political parties and the leaders, see that what great change you bring in the Indian society. So this is the way, so the political parties by supporting the women and their participation can be increased my dear students. So these are the points you can check out and I go for question number 28 right now. The 28th question is here, differentiate between secondary tertiary sectors with examples. Secondary sector and what is tertiary sector? Secondary sector is an industrial sector. And mostly industrial sector, most of the industries. So even we have the constructions and many other even, but generally it is called as industrial sector. And what is happening here in this secondary sector? A process of manufacturing, process of manufacturing. And coming to this tertiary sector, this tertiary sector is here. So, I will take another color, right? Tertiary sector, it is a service sector. It never produces anything. Understand? So any, any, it means that so goods are not produced. Goods are not produced. So it never produces any goods, but it produces all the services which are most important for the growth of industrial sector and the primary sector that is agriculture sector and many other allied activities right in the sector. The first two sectors depends on service sector but the secondary sector is all about processing and manufacturing and so bringing the natural products into next level, next form and make them more useful and so more value based. Understand? This secondary sector if you see in which manufacturing of cotton cotton textiles, sugar, iron and steel, cement and many other industries comes under. So all these secondary activities because the final product is brought up, you know in all which what is happening? The final product is brought here, understand? But here the most of the services, yes, yes, you know very well, the services like, so we have the banking and transportation, communication, and many other comes under this sector. 
and all the sectors are very very important no doubt for an economy but whereas come to the service sector so service sector gives rise to primary and secondary sectors and due to the importance and greater development of primary and secondary sectors the tertiary sector develops this is what is all about the uh, difference between secondary and tertiary sectors my dear children now i go for question number 29 how did print come into existence in europe explain or there is an a choice 29th question so how did access to books create a new culture of reading so these two questions any one of the question you could explain my dear children so now i'll take the first question first the how did print come into existence in europe so this is question number so 29 is this related to 12, uh, 2095 yes the period of 2095 right it is all about europe it is all about europe as in 19 1295 what was happened if you see so what was happened in 1295 marco polo marco polo yes he was a great explorer marco polo was a great so italian explorer returned to italy you know after he gained lot of uh, knowledge about printing and so many years of explorations in china he acquired lot of knowledge in printing because by that time china had uh, a greater printing technology in wood printing you know wood block printing are already we discussed this wood block printing in china in china was very much developed so during this period before 1295 so in 1295 what happened some years of exploration by marco polo in china he acquired all the knowledge from chinese of wood printing and he was returned to so here uh, europe that is uh, italy and marco polo brought this knowledge complete knowledge here then luxury editions still hand written by the time what was the condition the most of the luxury editions were hand written in europe and there were the manuscripts and many you know calligraphs and calligraphers and many others used to write on their own and design them wonderfully yeah, the every page was designed you know so such conditions were prevailed but so with the information and technology brought by marco polo after 1295 there was a greater development in this technology in euro printing technology in europe this wood block printing was brought up and and later so printing was become so cheap printing become so cheap because the manuscripts were uh, you know designed and prepared very individually and wonderfully very costly and even time taking you know so but later this wood block printing which was brought by marco polo which made the europeans to so go for more and more printing and merchants and students in the universities and towns brought cheaper printed so copies and they used to enjoy all that copies understand so this is what is the first question my dear students right so then the next question is all about how did access to books create how did access to books create a new culture of reading and we need to explain the new culture of reading how it was developed if you see so when you talk about the new culture of reading so you have to talk about common people so when you talk about common people so these people mostly lived in oral cultures the most of the time the people were believed in or they were following oral cultures my dear students and in the what is a oral culture because most of the common people they were not highly educated uneducated uneducated isn't it even in the most of the areas of europe 
at the whole of the Europe you compare. So before the 18th and 19th centuries, before long back, right, the uh, uneducated population was high. And so the oral culture was spread like few of the educated people used to read some of the texts and these common people used to enjoy by listening them. And, and or sometimes they used to see some kind of plays so performed in the society, such kind of plays were they, they, they saw and they used to enjoy. So this is what you call it as the oral culture like. But the so print culture brought, there is new culture, yes print or the books created a new culture of reading. You know, once the books were printed regularly after the steam, uh, yes, like uh, printing, uh, print, uh, print technology was developed in Europe in after 19th century. You know, now the books are printed in vernacular languages, vernacular languages. So earlier, before to this vernacular languages, so in Europe, two classical languages were there. So the Latin, the Latin language and the Greek language, most of the books in philosophy, science, maths or whatever so related to the regular, regular culture, tradition, most books of all, all the developments were only available in Latin and Greek. These two were the classical languages and the common people could never so read all that, only few people could able to afford and even read them. Understand? And the rest of the people used to follow the only oral culture, that's all. But so when the books were created new, yes, printing was become, yes, wonderful, expanded, you know, and most books were printed in vernacular languages. And even by that time in most of the parts of Europe by 19th century and after, education was also expanded with this, you know, new culture of reading expanded, new culture of reading expanded, my dear students. This is what you need to so discuss about this question of question number 29, my dear. And next, I go for so next question number 30. Why did Gandhi decided to launch nationwide Satyagraha against the proposed Rahul Act 1919? As you, now you have to see first of all, what is Rahul Act? It was launched by Mr. Rahul Act, so one of the important person here in the British administration. And so in 1919 it was launched hurriedly. Yes, most hurriedly it was launched as we know that and as already we discussed that it was launched by the British government most hurriedly and imperial government, British imperial government was launched this. Why the reasons? If you see, so 1908, sorry, 1914 to 18, the first world war, world war one was run. As we all know very well, the Indians were expecting many things from British, many concessions from British, so from the beginning and we were fighting for our independence, we need freedom, so we wanted British to quit India, understand in all these conditions you know the, the conditions grew and by the time so World War was started and you know the British without consenting any of the Indian leaders, INC or any other, so they declared that India is going to support British in the first world war. So then, so yes, Brit Indian support continued to British in the first world war, so against the central powers and then, so during this, you know, so around they thought six months of war, three months of war, six months, nine months, even it continued for long four years. Then during all these years, the Indians were expecting a kind of concessions that British is going to give a kind of freedom or so more representation, more representation or, ex or it is expecting for, you know, so dominion status, dominion. So most of the leaders were expecting dominion status. So but some of the other leaders, they knew very well about the attitude of the British. So what was the attitude of the attitude of British here? So not to give, not to give any kind of concessions to Indians. So any of the concessions the British was not willing to give. And they knew very well, the British knew very well. So if none of the concessions given to the Indians, the Indian leaders definitely their rise in movement. 
all the indian people they start huge movement even by the time you know uh, you could say that gandhi ji already back to india so when he was back to india already he conducted his early movements so 17 and 18 and he he was grown very you know very fast he was grown as an undisputed leader in inc and in the country and his way of achieving goals was wonderful of his non violence and satyagraha so and by considering all these situations of the growth of nationalism in india so because the attitude of the british not to give any concessions in any level so to the indians they knew that indians and all the indian leaders they are in movements then so they launched hurriedly this rawlat act so what is this rawlat act there's arrest all the indian leaders first of all all the indian leaders are arrested all the indian leaders are arrested they are imprisoned and there won't be any leaders in the society to lead the movements understand so then under these conditions you know gandhi ji felt very very you know disturbed and very uh, felt very bad for this kind of unjust law you know it was a dark act so they regarded this as a dark act and an unjust law and against to that gandhi ji is uh, you know so reaction was very very high you know under these conditions and this question number 30a if you see so it uh, mahatma gandhi wanted non violent civil disobedience against the british unjust law understand he believed very strongly that it must be a movement in india against this unjust law but it, this must be non violent it's not violent because he was here to bring satyagraha non violence through which so through non cooperation through civil disobedience whatever the level through non cooperation he wanted to achieve this goal so there is a reason so he on 6th april a hartal was started by gandhi ji and during this period many rallies were organized in various cities and towns of india and workers were on strike in railway stations and workshops and so many were closed down and in different different areas so different inc- incidents were taken up and everywhere the people were so raising slogans against the british and so with this huge upsurge the british was very you know brutally suppressed the movement by taking many other so repressive measures brutally the movement was suppressed so this is all about uh, this why gandhi ji decided to launch nation wide movement in satyagraha and all the reasons for this against rawal attack 1919 then the second question is here why did the non cooperation movement spread to the countries countryside from the cities now as already we discussed for the first level of non cooperation movement it spread immediately in the cities and towns but because of some reasons later it was slowed down that also we discussed but so when the first non cooperation movement when gandhi ji explained how to follow non cooperation why should we follow non cooperation so that we could send british out of the country within one or two years as per his book hind swaraj that due to the cooperation of indians the british could able to withstand more than 200 years in india so if we stop cooperation within one two years that the british is going to leave india understand so under these conditions what to be disregarded disregarded or so left by the people and non cooperate in the areas it was explained very clearly by gandhi ji during this all these um, the non cooperation movement so so it immediately spread in the cities and towns but so later it was spread to the villages countryside for what reason countryside it was spread because countryside if you see most of the peasants india is a wonderful agricultural economy and so we had many you know lakhs of villages india is a is a home of villages understand sacred villages and in all these areas the people the peasants were really suffered under talukdars and landlords and you know heavy taxation over them and they were unable to pay taxation and even there were bad years and no proper rains 
and you know the famine conditions were prevailed dry region dry, dry dry seasons spells of seasons and even british because the first world war incurred many losses and more heavy expenditure was attained by the british right and under these conditions they wanted to meet such huge expenditure they wanted to uh, give more and more taxes to the so uh, village communities the peasants so this movement spread the non cooperation movement the with the call of gandhi ji spread to villages where the most of the peasants they turned against the talukdars and the landlords who were collecting heavy taxation and even there was a demand of beggar so by the landlords that free of cost they have to work on the lands of the landlord and even many other services are to be given free so and so under these conditions you know they took the call of gandhi ji's non cooperation and they stopped you know so naidobi bands were conducted in most of the areas against talukdars and land owners and later so with the initiation of mr baba ramachandra he was a, a sanyasi and he was an indentured labor to uh, fizi islands and later he was back here and he gathered so all the farmers towards uh, this unfair and unjust laws and unjust ways of collecting taxes over taxations and even so complete you know uh, land evictions most of the time farmers were facing problem of land evictions against all that baba ram chandra was guiding all these farmers and the area of avad was the best example was given in it is given in the textbook and where it was in in avad so baba ram chandra and added by jawaharlal nehru so most of the time jawaharlal nehru visited rural areas countryside and where the kisan sabhas were started avad kisan sabha and very very fast you know there was a spread of this kind of uh, agitations and movements by the peasants and hundreds and hundreds 200 300 so number of uh, the sabhas kisan sabhas were formed and you know these people took you know rai bareli 1920 there was an incident where so these taluk the houses of the talukdars and grain hordes were attacked by the peasants right these were all all the total situation so why it was spread and it was because of the suffering of the farmers right so heavy taxation is one point and so uh, and you know uh, implementation of beggar over these peasants by the landlords and even many other services were given and even so continuous land evictions was one of the other reason so these are all reasons one after the other you could explain for this question like why did non cooperation movement spread the country said from the cities and so you could easily explain the wonderful points right so then next we go for next we go for the question number 31 how do multinational corporations interlink production across countries you know this interlink production interlink production is the most important thing interlinking production by mncs by multinational corporations what are the ways they follow you know as it is very clearly explained interlinking production by the mncs there is a side heading and one after the other wonderfully explained in the textbook right so in which i'll take the first way so how the mncs interlinking production is the first one so this is point number 1 that is the uh, collaborations collaborations and or so agreements with existing companies with already there are existing companies in most of the economies so take for example so uh, in india so already in india so there is a company called mahindra and mahindra mahindra today you also know that mahindra it has so well known uh, cars and all we have trucks and buses and all even from mahindra this mahindra is already an existing company then so which company come to india ford ford company of usa come to india now this ford company made a collaboration 
you know joint venture is another word we could use here the joint venture joint ventures they made they made joint ventures collaborations and agreements they made with an already existing company so that easily they could grab the existing market because mahindra already had a wonderful market in india not only in india in many of the neighboring countries and different parts of the world mahindra was producing so there's kind of you know trucks vans and many other so industrial vehicles and all that so mahindra was wonderfully expanded in india so it joined hands four joined hands with mahindra so this is what is the first point so multinational corporations interlink production across the countries by following the way first one collaboration or agreements or joint ventures they make joint ventures this is the first point so then the set. so the first point is joint ventures and point number 2 is here that the point number 2 is here that the most common route for the mnc's for the uh, like interlinking the production was buy up the companies buy up the small companies has already an example given that so here uh, there is an american company so it bought one of the edible oil company in india understand so as already we know this we studied very clearly how the amenities because amenities have huge investments with them even sometimes they could even uh, you know influence the governments of the developing countries right they could invest in such a you know the uh, the budgets of the common small countries or the developing countries more than that they have their investments with that such a huge investments they come to the countries developing countries and they buy companies so the example given parak foods parak right and kargil so to today kargil is one of the leading company so millions of pouches they produce in a day understand so right such kargil company so by overtaking the buying parak and they expanded their production in india not only in india now throughout the world they are expanding their production spreading their market this is the second level and the third level is that so the third point is that give orders give orders to small companies small companies giving orders most of the branded companies today you see armani and pepe lee levi's wrangler whatever we have so world class brands throughout the world right so all these they do not manufacture everything understand but designing and even the quality or whatever the kind of designs and the the fit and whatever the clothes shoes or many other products they do not make understand they give orders there is a automobile industry so car has many parts understand it has uh, wheels it has lights it has brakes or clutch or whatever many products it has it has upholstery seats and many other so everything is not made the body and uh, and engine uh, they are the most important ones for the company and many other like tires lights clutch and many other so are supported by many other small country companies understand so like so these big companies give orders to small companies whereas in textile shoes or automobiles or wherever you see so they with the support of small producers they 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 finally make the final product and so through their brand they sell in the market because of this doing the small producers produce for these companies at the quality prescribed by them at a very low cost 
and but finally on the name of the brand original brand by this big mnc's they sell it in the international market at that at such a huge level of price you know so uh, five fold 10 fold market price you know uh, uh, profits for them understand in the market area so internationally so this is what is the these are the three areas we need to discuss so whereas even some of the children are confused with this question i believe few children are there they believe that so when the question is asked about mnc's how they interlink production they believe you know they write there is an another question related to this complex ways what are the complex ways followed by the mnc's in production so complex ways is nothing but designing and an r and d in america for example isn't it and designing technology everything is of america or any other big country and now so then making of small small parts and everything and all the parts making manufacturing in small uh, by the mncs in developing countries and all these parts for sent for assemblage to the nearness to the market like mexico or car cannot be sent directly so it's very costly but the parts of the car can be sent to mexico there it's an assemblage part and immediately from mexico to american market it is very near so they could reduce most of the transportation costs and many other costs so of manufacturing an automobile or many other products not only automobile so complex ways of manufacturing by the mncs is different but this is what is the one two three steps the child has to explain for the multi corporationals how they interlink production and finally there is a statement there is a side heading in the textbook that how mncs interlink production and at the last of the side heading so this is how are thus mncs interlink production through this one two three ways joint ventures buy up the small companies and giving orders to small companies so this is what the correct answer my dear children and the next we go for question number 31b explain any five steps taken by the central and state governments to attract foreign investments so what are the ways that the uh, our uh, governments are following to so bring up this foreign investments if you see so first point is here so we are setting up or the governments are setting up special economic zones we call it as sezs sezs right so special economic zones so which provide world class facilities for the mncs to come and set up their industries where in which the most of the resources you know most of the resources are very much cheaper including so the areas of raw material is cheaper and skilled and unskilled labor is available in these areas of where these special economic zones have been created and you know the subsidized prices of so acquiring land electricity water supply and many other world class facilities including transportation communication this radar links and satellite links of the yes, with all that you know the industry is set up in special economic zones this is the first way of the governments trying to attract the foreign investments so mnc is come to set up in india or many other developing countries understand so sezs are set up in the first level and the next level flexible labor laws next flexible labor laws as we know very well labor laws are in india very strict as after 18 19th centuries of industrial revolution and after you know the most of the countries under united nations or nation after 1945 we stipulated many rules and regulations so that the workers in the in the world are not to be encountered or so they do not be suffering under this laws you know so such labor laws were we immediately we also implemented in india but so when it comes to the mncs so when it comes to the mncs so or to attract the foreign investments the governments are giving lot of flexibility in this labor laws so that most mncs could come to 
developing countries to establish their MNCs where the, when the labor laws are flexible, they could utilize this, the services of the labor laws for more hours with a low payments like, isn't it? So not expected level for an American, you know, an IT company you take example, an American user is working in America, Native American is working in America, he must be paid 10 lakhs. But there is a relaxation here, the same work is done by five Indians, right, uh, more than 20 Indians like or so each is, each person is paid only 2 lakhs, understand. But 2 lakh rupees per month is very high for Indians, but when comparatively it is a great uh, flexibility for the, uh, this company, so pay less comparatively. And this only one person working the work of five Americans, understand, I have only single Indian working for an MNC, the work of five Americans, five Europeans, understand? So, so, so there is a huge profit for, so when labor laws are flexible, their timings are flexible and even, so work nature and even the, uh, the ways of uh, rules followed by the uh, organized sector rules are all in which there is a lot of flexibility. This is the second point that, so we attract foreign investments by flex, uh, by making the labor laws more flexible and even so trade barriers, as you know very well, trade barriers, you know, so the flexibility in this area also, the removal, most of the areas, you know, the trade barriers are removed by taking up liberalization policies under WTO and most countries if the liber the trade barriers are many barriers if we have in India and MNCs are not interested to invest money, understand? Because their income is reduced with all these barriers but instead so if all the trade barriers are removed, so very free they come here and invest and utilize most of the resources of India and they increase their profits and expand their trade throughout in, throughout the world. There is a reason, so removal of trade barriers, you know, the removal of trade barriers is one of the important areas the, the governments are trying to so bring investments, international investments and policy of licensing. Even policy of licensing is also very much liberalized with the liberal policies by following all this that the governments are trying to attract more foreign investments into so India, right? This is what about the question number 31. Then now we are going to the question number 32. Democracy, this is from uh, DP. Democracy is a better form of government. This is always. It is always no doubt in that. So democracy is, so now today you see, so in 20th century, 21st century, most of the countries are following democracy. And the sway for the dictatorships, military governments are going down. So because you see today the conditions in Pakistan or many other conditions where the dictatorial governments or military governments are ruling, so where the people really suffer. But where in the governments where, so we have the democracy, it's always better form of government, my dear students, no doubt in which. So the reason it promotes equality among the citizens, the question number first 132a, it promotes equality among citizens. So what kind of equality here, if you see the three levels of equality, the social equality, so political equality and economic equality. In all these areas, there is a guarantee for the citizens. There is a at least minimum guarantee. So, but this kind of guarantee so, can never be given in the dictatorships or any other kinds of governments. So, the most people, they enjoy the equality in all these areas. This is the first point we could explain here in the area of uh, the why democracy is better than the other governments. And the next one, so dignity. Next one, dignity. It enhances the dignity of the people, you know. So, the, the, by giving the honor, it is a lot of honor for all the citizens. You know, in India, so Indian citizens, we, we all are enhanced here with our dignity, uh, with all the equality of rights. 
So we have wonderful rights, all the fundamental rights so have been given to all the people and the dignity and honor to every citizen and so women are under dignified condition, so children are under dignified condition, see everybody's so views are accepted and moreover you see by giving so minorities, minorities, so greater importance to the minorities due role for the minorities and majorities wish never be imposed truly in Indian society or most of the democracies. Most democracies take the best example India because we are living in and even any other so democratic countries in which so this kind of dignity for the human beings so this is also one of the reason then so coming to the next point so decision making so decision making you know what kind of decisions are made so most of the decisions made in a democracy based on so dissent deliberation consultation you know with the consent of the people people's leaders of the people understand so and everybody is considered and you know, one or the other way or so something or the other way so people are participating in decision making so whereas in the election so verdicts giving election verdicts or we directly or indirectly in many ways we influence the governments in making decisions and the most decisions are taken through deliberations and discussions and negotiations that's the reason so it's worth you know so spending time by the democracy is really worth of doing all that decision making no doubt so we could say that democracies are better than any other like dictatorships or the militaries or any other monarchical governments in this area of decision making it's so wonderful and you know so the next point that you could discuss here conflicts conflicts so a country like india or many other countries in the world today we discussed about belgium discussed about sri lanka india and most instances we can take from the world right in which so it's so common that in a country we are in the society so there's a lot of social divisions so social participations right many other right in which so conflicts so common understand but only guarantee here so in democracy that so there is a chance for reducing conflicts understand so in democracy we have power sharing every so in a society government there is a power sharing in the society in the sections of the society power sharing in the political parties there is a power sharing like in everywhere there is a chance for reducing you know prudential reasons of the so power sharing right so reduce the democracy is always try here democracies so through so they reducing the conflicts and set up the situation of co conditions so by giving equal status and dignity of labor and making laws wonderfully and reduce conflicts and one more thing is that there is always a way for correcting our mistakes there is always a room there is always a room so for correcting correcting mistakes you know we make many laws so we follow many policies many schemes we uh, we generate here and uh, we we look into the welfare of the people so in all the way of this administration and the welfare of the people and in the governance so sometimes we may go uh, we may do some mistakes it is true that so nobody is uh, away from this so mistakes are common but so but here there is a room for correcting its mistakes democracy alone produces this kind of uh, uh, governance or this kind of situations no other uh, system of governance so gives these many advantages so we strongly say that so you have to explain children this is a five mark question so there must be these are all must be the side headings five side headings like first of all so producing equality and the dignity of the so dignity and honor of the people 
and decision making area so reducing the conflicts and room for correcting the mistakes these are all the major side headings under which you should have a kind of explanation why they are so wonderful democracies and also we could explain that democracies have standard rules and regulations and stipulated under it their constitu written constitutions wonderful constitutions and they have the system of the legislature executive and judiciary and uh, coordination among them and always the good laws come up and even execution is wonderful understand so like many other advantages we could write about the democracy so definitely it's a better form of government my dear children this is all about this explanation about this so better form of government then the second question of 32 democracy is an accountable and legitimate government you know accountable is a word it's a wonderful word you know when you talk about democracy accountability right so democracy is always accountable right I say my parent my parents are most accountable to me your parents are accountable to me uh, to you right and so the system of education or present day the school I am studying it is more accountable right because you know so decision making you expect so expectation so as people of a particular country in a democratic country we expect from the government we expect from the parents and parents expect from children and society expects from citizens citizens expect from the community understand so always so there is a point of expectation if any government acts or response so to the needs requirements isn't it that government is most accountable understand they respond immediately to the needs of the people yes such government is most accountable my dear students understand that is what we need to always explain that so you know the Governments are most expected, so most expectations we have. So such governments are accountable governments. As in the decision making already, just previously we discussed some of the things like, so how the governments are accountable in making the and worth spending time in negotiations and uh, discussions, right? So this, has, this makes the whole government, democratic governments, more accountable. Understand? So then next we come to how governments are more uh, legitimate because most of the governments are made, you know, and at the same time, you know, they, they follow the norms and procedures, norms and procedures. So when a government is run on number of uh, wonderful norms and procedures, then we call such government as legitimate government legitimate government right in such legitimate governments because government is following and so running the governance through norms and procedures whatever so law making norms and procedures implementation law and procedure and a norm understand everything so through constitution understand there is a reason so it is a legitimate government so where so there is a lot of feature of transparency so people could even examine the government understand they are not so quiet they are not uh, you know uh, uh, passive in the society of democracy in which democracy the people so uh, uh, you follow uh, the governments are followed a lot of transparency we could peep through the government and into the government and we can examine the governance right and everywhere if the governments are not working properly what is that we do so when government must be accountable to us if it is not working properly so we show our verdict so we we participate in the decision making and we change the governments there is a reason so people have the right to change the government so each and every government is accountable and each and every uh, democratic government is legitimate by following norms and procedures 
and follow a lot of transparency. So this is what is the basic explanation about uh, the how accountable and legitimate government is the democratic government. You could expand based on this, my dear children, right? And next comes the question number 33. Explain the features of the primitive subsistence commercial and commercial farming. You know, primitive subsistence and commercial farming, you know, primitive subsistence. So, it is a uh, age old practice of primitive subsistence in India. So, question number 33 in which we could clearly explain what are the conditions of primitive agriculture. Some pockets of India this is followed and this primitive subsistence agriculture is practiced in small patches of land and in which there is no greater technology and a human, so mostly human based and animal based do cutting animals and so the old varieties of and traditional tools and implements are used. Traditional tools and implements are used in a small patches of and most traditionally they produce, they go grow agriculture, they pro, the crops are grown and even not all varieties of crops are grown, isn't it? In which primitive agriculture you can see zoom and slash and burn, zooming agriculture is one. So, isn't it? So, in, the, in such a way, the most uh, you know, less labor force, less labor force, less technology, less usage of uh, this fertilizers or they never use HYV seeds, right? And chemicals and all that you don't use, right? And very limited. So, you know, subsistence is a word is when the people grow for them. You know, subsistence agriculture is nothing but I grow and I consume. And we grow and we consume. Understand? This is a small community of people and we grow something for ourselves and for our consumption. If something is little surplus, so they store for the coming years. Because if the coming years are dry and even the bad years might be, so that is the reason a very limited they, they store. Understand? But they do not produce for the international markets. They do not produce for the market, sell and uh, so grow and gain lot of uh, income. That is not the uh, target of these people. So, but whereas so the other side, commercial farming, if you see the commercial farming, so it is most advanced. So, large areas of estates uh, brought under this commercial farming in which so the high technology and, and technologically advanced and even investment based it has very high investment based and use of labor force is also more and intensively you know, so commercially you know, there is a kind of intensive and uh, intensive is a little different but in commercial large scale industry agriculture is large scale huge estates are used and with high technology and every input is very high and spending lot of money in large areas huge production they make. This production is not locally to consume. This production is for international markets. They produce for the markets. Commercial sell this produce and so get the profits. Understand? So they use all the latest uh, methods of techniques and even machinery they, they use, even the levelers, cutters, threshers, harvesters, isn't it? So, all that they use heavily and they produce heavy for the international market to sell. So, this is what is commercial agriculture. In this way, you compare these two on many areas and so that you could gain 5 marks, my dear students. And the next, if you see, explain the features of intensive subsistence and plantation subsistence. This is little, you see, intensive. Intensive subsistence in this. So, whatever the land is available, but in which they try to grow more. Intense is the word itself, so gives a meaning. More, so more and more. So use the land again and again, isn't it? So in the primitive subsistence agriculture, they might use the land for a, a once in a year, understand? But in this intense agriculture, so they use the land, though the land size is small, but it has utilized so twice and thrice in an area, understand? So by using, so the set of HYV seeds they use, HYV seeds and then so better you know irrigation, irrigation is compulsory 
without irrigation so hiv seeds cannot withstand and even in and after hiv seeds are used you know fertilizers like chemical pesticides and fertilizers are used fertilizers so it's, a, it's all a set 1 2 3 using hiv seeds chemical uh, pesticides and fertilizers and even with better irrigation so this total set is implemented on so uh, the same piece of land same land and they try to grow more they try to grow more on the same piece of land so one two three crops in a year they try to grow grow three crops in a year on the same land so this is what is intense but this is this is an intense is a labor intense even in which even huge labor is also used this is about intense so when you are now you go for now against the intense now we go for plantation so plantation agriculture is so most scientific advanced right so in an area single crop single variety of crop is grown so and plantations most of the plantations right are attached by manufacturing units manufacturing units or or man it's not instead of manufacturing i could say that uh, instead of manufacturing i could say uh, uh, like uh, 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 like processing units so processing units so most of the processing units are attached to the so production area and a single crop is taken in a larger area and so most scientific methods most scientific methods are used and high investments is in high investments and even so labor huge labor is required understand and so more scientifically systematically so this single crop is grown and its investment is very high you know so and even it's so because it's processed immediately immediately and it has this kind of plantations have great demand in the markets and the best examples tea coffee right so rubber right and even the plantains like banana so coconut so like many other so plantations so most importantly so tea coffee so internationally these products have so great so, uh, demand and so kind of special conditions so kind of a special uh, like geographical conditions these are grown so some pockets of india and internationally also some of the areas are only these plantations are very much developed and these plantations were brought by the british to india my dear students then this is all about so question number 33 and we are going for the next level 34 yes this is what we have come to the area and uh, the last before say last last but one uh, last before sec section is this and this section is all about so competency based source based the source based questions so in which a source has been given read the source and answer the questions that follow now this source is all about rise of political parties so how they are linked directly linked to the emergence of representative democracies see this statement representative democracies they are linked with representative democracies how there is a growth of representative democracies today the most of the world is following representative democracies whether the like parliamentary system or presidential system whatever the demo all most democracies are the representative form of democracies now based on that there is one paragraph now see what are the questions we have explain the meaning of a political party they are asking you know in which this given paragraph what is a political party is not widely explained but with the 
with what the knowledge we have, the previous knowledge, what is a political party that we, the children have to define. The first question is here, the political party, what is a political party here that it's a group of people who come together to contest elections and hold power and form the government. And this group of people come together, they are combined based on a kind of a specific ideologies. Understand? A kind of a, a like a, uh, like the left fronts we have, the centrist parties we have, left parties we have, right wing parties we have. These political parties, so they have their kind of a identity, ideology. And the people who wished or who wanted the same thing to be happened in the society so, and believe in the same ideology, they come together as a group. And they try to uh, form the party, political party, and even they participate in the elections. And then they try to gain the votes in the elections, they form the government, and then they implement their ideologies. Understand? This is what is a political party, the first question, right? The next, rise of political parties is directly linked to the emergence of representative democracies. So, support this question, you know, the same question. So, you see the last year question paper, the same as it is. Now, this question is completely based on the, this paragraph. Now, every child... So, even, so you feel like uh, I may not write, and the first question is very easy. What is the political party we have learnt? So, no need of support of this paragraph, you can write directly and by taking the support of the paragraph, so you could write the answer for this, how the political parties are directly linked. So, here, so to this uh, so democracy or this, this kind of a, uh, uh, democracies, representative form of democracies, we could support and it is very clearly given, right? So, as we have seen, large societies need representative democracy because, so we cannot follow direct democracy. Shall we follow direct democracy in India, America, like big countries? That we call all this population like more than 100, 140 crores of population in India to a place. So, where you accommodate these many people? Okay, you have accommodated. After you have accommodated, how many of you know what is a law? What is to be made? How is to be made? So, what are the benefits of laws? What kinds of laws are important for the country, the growth, development? You know, so, so many people, they do not know anything. So, that is why direct democracies, we cannot. Once upon a time, the, in the early stages, the Athen, Athens and all in the areas, so limited population, they used to gather in place and make decisions. But now, we cannot. So they are not suitable. So, what is suitable to the democracy here? Representative democracy. So, we conduct elections on behalf of people and we the people elect our representatives. And we, even we cannot make a huge assembly or Lok Sabha where everybody go and sit. But here... So, we are sending 543 representatives to Lok Sabha. They are sitting there and even some 250 so members, they are the representatives of the states, right? They are sitting in Rajya Sabha. Understand? So, the parliament is a combination of the president, Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, where these are, they are our representatives. They sit and they discuss about different, different requirements because the country is more complex more complex in its population, regions, languages might be or different developmental goals might be or different sections of the society and you know this kind of social divisions to social barrier, many are there. So, what are their needs? Isn't it? So, what they require? So, all that views, different different views of the various issues, everything must be taken up. So, in direct democracy, we cannot so, it can only be helpful, only we can do it in representative democracies. Understand? That the modern, almost all the modern economies so have many great goals, you know, you know, objectives and specifications. To meet all that need requirements and needs of the complex societies, today we definitely require representative democracies. That is the answer of the, it is what is the direct linkage. Understand? So, if not, we cannot manage. So, representative democracies are most important. 
and why are political parties necessary for the condition of democracy the same situation again so you know political parties are treated as the wheels of the democracy so you know they are the vehicles of the democracy it's not wheels like or the vehicles like democracy so now there is no political party in the country who would contest okay so many people contested who would form the government okay they try to form the government so what the philosophies they follow what the ideology they follow because if suppose so now 543 out of which we have many parties right so coalition governments are formed here in india nowadays today nda is for ruling and in nda so the major party is bjp and even so the other partners are also having their ideologies now this nda government is implementing all the ideology of bjp including the ideologies and importance of the views of the other partners of nda but so when there is no political party so 543 independent candidates come and here contested and out of the contestants so 543 members are elected then whose philosophy can be implemented whose ideology is implemented so who is going to form the government how many people come together and if they come together will they stand together how long you know so it's a huge hung type of governments are formed and they cannot withstand and even there is no proper way of achieving any goal of democracy that's the reason so democracies are the most important so areas here the sorry political parties are the most important conditions for the democracy if there are no political parties so the democracy is not that successful so and at the same time we can also say that so in, a, in in political system how many parties are there and one party two party multi party so nowadays you know the complexity of the society is where so like india where multi party system is most relevant and also see it's not one party is important or two parties are important for country like india it is a democracy so representative democracy so multi parties should play a role you understand in that case if there is no dem- political party how come just expect the future of the democracies right that is why democracies are most important my dear students right and now so we move on to the next question so question number 35 this is all about the uh, first world war and industrial growth the industrial growth of during the first world war was slow the paragraph saying and the war created dramatically new situation with the british mills busy with war production to meet the needs of the army right and the manchester imports into india declined so which lesson is this global world right indian mills had a vast home market to supply as the war prolonged and indian factories were called upon to supply war needs jute bags cloth or many other what is the requirements and what kind of importance that india uh, acquired and all that so this is what is that you can see the paragraph now at the end of the so uh, paragraph even how the cotton production collapsed and exports and cotton cloth of from britain fell and what conditions and situations were prevailed so in the world and in india these kind of situations were given here and now uh, give the answers uh, the like uh, the answers for the questions we discussed question number 35 35 1 why did manchester imports decline in india why did manchester so incline uh, declined in india yes 35 yes one manchester export to india declined after the first world war because factories and mills were busy in producing goods to fulfill the needs of the war there was a great need for war war industries or the war items understand and the requirements for the soldiers years together four years right it was you know the most devastated war and even very costly war the first an unprecedented war never expected this kind of war so in the world right such a it was just like a war it was started later it was named as first world war later it was named as first level, after the second world war it was named as first world war but why it's a world war 
you know unprecedented in any area loss of uh, life loss of uh, you know spending of money and uh, different requirements so in that case if you see so uh, huge uh, you know the factories and mills were busy in producing goods to fulfill the needs of the army hence the supply to india became limited and mostly earlier the british was concentrated on trade with india and how best they produce in india in the textile mills or whatever in different products and they are produced so cheap in the industries manufacturing industries and then they were brought to india and sold for high rates because so no taxations much because they were ruling india so no no different different varieties of taxations were cesses were not put on them and they could sell plentifully here and gain many profits but because of this re reason here that war reason so the in imports into india was fell sharply and very much limited this provided an opportunity for all the indian industries so indian industries consolidated great position understand so many many areas uh, where we got the orders army uniforms tents leather boots horse and mule saddles and a host of other items jute bags these are all required in war so to support the army so all these kind of uh, orders were given to the indian industries so one side so import from the britain reduced and the other side so the indian companies got many orders from so the war area the britain and the supplies of the products increased and the the indian industries were boomed so during this first world war this is what is the first question and its answer and then the next second one 35 to so because of all these reasons manchester imports declined and why why could manchester never recapture its old position in indian market after the first world war it's very very clearly given that after the war Manchester never recaptured its old position in the Indian market unable to modernize and com compete with US you know so by the time United States Germany Japan and they had grown up understand and so the economy of the Britain crumbled due to huge war for long years and this is a britain was a major company uh, sorry major country in allied forces against germany so it spent lot of money and it was crippled under these loans and even it was crumbled uh, in its economy dramatically so that was the reason so even after the first world war so even in india also most of the industries were gained a lot because of the first world war right so it could not again regain and recapture the market of india my dear students and analyze any two benefits of the first world war to india so what are the two the benefits like 35.3 year as the war prolonged indian factories were called upon to supply many things as already we discussed so the inputs right like orders for indian industries increased and indian industries was were boomed right so the first point the children have to explain that so industrialization or the, all the indian industries in india boomed up because of the first world war because of many orders in different areas already it is given in the paragraph itself by using that all that area so they could explain the first point and the second point because of this kind of a condition you know, the new factories were come up and the new factories were set up in india and so these were so in these areas in the most of the industries so multiple shifts were followed so three shifts morning shift afternoon shift or the evening shift and even the night shift so plenty of people required in manufacturing many things for the war in in india and at the same time the manchester products were like you know reduced when manchester reduced its imports into india now we need to produce for our children our our, our citizens right in india so in india we need we require many things like uh, textiles we require and many other mechanical products and uh, many other things required by, for the people right that all started manufacturing in india understand 
So in India for the needs of the Indians we produced and for the requirements of the war we produced because of that reason you know new set of industries had come up. So they sprung so in the uh, landscape of India. So with this you know so more generation of jobs. Huge employment generation was made. This employment generation increased the income levels of the people. Understand? So a lot of industrialization, urbanization, uh, these conditions were prevailed during this period of war and after conditions. So, but after this, that uh, this Manchester so could not retain its position again in India. So it couldn't, right? Get the same position like before because Indian industries were boomed up. So this two advantages. The first one, so varieties of industries, varieties of industries were set up in India. First point based on that because of what reasons they have to explain. Second point, so huge generation of employment in the country and increase in incomes and standard of living was set up right in India. These are the two points they could explain. So these are the three point, three questions and explanation. So for this paragraph and so 36 paragraph, 30, question number 36, this is also a source based question. Most of the objections to the projects arose due to their failure to achieve purpose for which they were built. Ionically, the dams, I don't know, now this is all about dams, multi-purpose projects. So many of the multi-purpose projects we constructed in India for the development of the country. In Jawaharlal Nehru said that they are the modern temples of the economy integrate the development of the urban with rural societies so that so they are called the temples of modern India dams but these dams are facing many you know uh, like scrutinies right they are very much scrutinized nowadays and they are uh, kind of uh, you know againstism against these dams why you know based on that there are some questions so name the movement against the river project in Gujarat so in Gujarat, Sardar Sarovar Dam constructed, right? You know, Narmada Bachavo Andolan. The first answer is Narmada Bachavo Andolan. Then the second question, how have big dams mostly been unsuccessful in controlling the floods? In controlling the floods, you know, the dams that were constructed to control floods have triggered floods. You know, instead of controlling, they triggered they had increased trigger they triggered the floods so due to you know so over siltation problem so heavy siltation problem so there is a natural flow is reduced when there is a natural flow is reduced and the number of dams you are constructing at the at the over at the natural flow of the dam, river and the, you know the siltation that takes place in every level right and the siltation you know decreases the so level of uh, dam's capacity so actually the dam has a capacity of holding such a water you know capacity of water targeted water but because of this heavy siltation under the the bed is formed right the capacity of holding water is reduced whenever heavy rains or flash floods so the water rushes gushes into the so uh, dams but dams couldn't hold the actual capacity of water because of heavy siltation and which leads to unexpected floods understand and the governments people have a lot of confidence on these dams that they control floods but they sometimes in not every case but sometimes they trigger floods this is one of the reason the big dams have mostly been unsuccessful in controlling the floods at the time of excessive rainfall only you could understand that you have to write it's not that regular rain so that i said flash floods understand the when the huge water gushes into the areas of these dams right then only this kind of situations and the floods have not only devastated life of the property but also have caused extremely the soil erosion you know and loss of uh, the vegetation natural habitat for many animals right 
all that the problems when you have discussed so this of the area of second question then the third question is all about analyze any two merits of multi purpose river projects you can write all the merits not two you know very well right so dams have been constructed for the development of irrigation storage of huge water which is in turn used for irrigation facilities and uh, extensive production of a uh, you know hydel energy hydro energy hydro energy projects we have constructed along with every dam that is why it's a multi purpose dams right hydro electricity generation control of floods and water for industry water for irrigation agriculture and water for the domestic and uh, the city urbanization conditions right in many conditions many areas we could write about the so mal the advantages merits of the multi purpose projects right so they take the advancement of the development of the economy by integrating the rural and urban so the temples of the modern economy right so this is all about uh, the 36th question and the last and final we have come to the question number 37 so this is also very important question number 37 so we have uh, the mapping here 37 question the two places this first level of mapping the 37 question two places a b marked on the given political outline map of india and by using these clues or the statements or information the information given and write their write their correct names on the lines drawn the first point is here that the place where the session of the indian national congress was held in december 1920 understand so where this point can be discussed like so that there was a tussle between the two groups of the congress inc so one group says that to participate in the elections and the other group says that to follow gandhi ji and launch national wide movement and send british out but there was a tussle and situation was tough and then finally a decision was made a compromise was held in this december 1920 between the two groups of inc the compromise was held and finally non cooperation movement was adopted and the decision was taken to implement understand so this this is at nagpur in 1920 so nagpur session and the place where jallian wala bag incident occurred this is amritsar as a, already we know 13th july right so and now we see ah uh, yes so now we go for this so a and b we, we see a b then the question now this is always you write capital letters already a is here now at the top of the map you have to keep question number 37 so this is always question number 37 question number is compulsory some children you you write some simply 37 right so may not be visible you tag this paper so the question number may not be visible without question number so there is no guarantee of gaining all the marks completely right understand that is the reason question number 37 we have to write here yes so at the right corner right and now the a is nagpur you write in capital letters nagpur the same pen what you are using you can use it understand blue color you are using overall you can use this blue color or black color you are using for writing all the answers use black color or you can use pencil there is no restriction actually so there is a doubt that pencil i use or pen i use right pencil pen but so most comfortable because use first pencil and later so light little erase uh, yes my answers are correct you are finalized and then write with pen so then the second one is this is a, this is amritsar yes so already question number a b already given so you need not to write the question here right so a b amritsar and nagpur you can right so then coming to the so the next one is here that next level this is for visually uh, yes impaired and now this is b level 37 b noida a software technology park it is in uttar pradesh noida bailadila is iron and iron ore mine 
so now valedilla is in chatisgarh ch i'm ch chatisgarh right and tarapur is in maharashtra so a nuclear plant haldia is a seaport in west bengal now we look into this so now what is the question numbers in b 1 2 3 4 understand so now i go to map now uh, whenever you see here yes we go for this is 37 question number 37 a and b okay na question number 37 a and b now coming to the b we have 1 2 3 4 what is the first one so noida this is delhi okay next to delhi if this is the location this is noida and before you go for yes i'll take it again yes this is the location of noida and what is the question number that is question number 1 question number 1 compulsory question number right so in the in b 37 b question number 1 right this is noida clearly you write the name in capital letters okay and the next question is here that what is the next question here bailadela it's an iron ore mine bailadela is in so chatisgarh bailadela is in chatisgarh right so here it comes so this is two question number 2 baila dila okay and then question number 3 i go back again question number tarapur is a nuclear power plant any symbol you could use right i use a symbol like yes green color i am taking now for your visibility yes yes this is question number 1 2 3 right tarapur yes this is question number 3 tarapur this is bailadilla and the first one is here that this is so sorry yes yes mm, this is delhi and here is right this is noida one noida yes and uh, the last one is haldia port haldia sea port now i'll take blue color right and here is kolkata and here exactly you have to locate understand here this is the area so once again i'll erase it no okay there is all hmm. this is haldia and question number 4 so this is what is mapping my dear students right so all the four you have to do and best of three will be given and a and b compulsory but whatever you write so i believe you have written wonderfully and you made a location with the question number and even labeling also you made so this is all about so this set of question paper so that we extensively so uh, gone through and all the 37 questions we explain we discussed today i hope you people enjoyed this explanation and everything and so uh, with all that answers you are also accepting the answers and so definitely what the answers today i have given is 100% the accurate answers accurate locations of mapping and accurate explanations for each and every question thank you thank you for listening and we'll be back in few minutes for discussing one more set thank you one set time ఇంకా సట్టేరు
good evening children back to the session and today you see i have three sets in my hand right already one of the set already we discussed extensively each and every question with every explanation what kind of points to be written and what kind of answers for the objective types and including map and even the source based equations each and every question how many points to be written how and what are the areas major sources side headings everything i have written and explained now after i analyzed all the three sets the, all the sets are same there is no much difference of the so sets here i have an another set for for example so for for time being if we go through an another set here that just a moment so we'll go back yes i refresh this is what is the previous one is only loading right you can see these are all the same questions but they have been jumbled understand as first question as fifth question seventh question as into ninth question so like almost all the questions jumbled so in most uh, level right so that's the reason now you see i'll take up one one more set this is set 3 so i look into this now so in which the question number 1 see this question is an another number in so the other set what we discussed now question number 1 is of match the columns column 1 and 2 so this is all about union list state list concurrent list residuary subjects and the answer is, might also be so jumbled right okay now we'll see union list in which banking so the first one is 3 even options are also not changed so the same answer question number 1 answer is a and question number 2 which of the following is an example of coming together federation usa answer b option b usa is the right answer and question number 3 so the two assertion and reason type of statements the same question belgium amended their constitution four times and it was done in the in the reason amendments uh, amendments were enable here to everyone to live together happily isn't it so the answer is a and again the question number 4 is of the match the following two sets one set is of ports of india and type of port the same question is in the question number 4 kandla is in so developed after independence so one is 4 so 2 is 3 3 2 4 one option a is the right answer for fourth question in set 3 and set 3 question number 5 is again uh, assertion and reason type of question in which assertion a is of agriculture and industry move hand in hand and the same the like same question there's no change in that reason is all that about industrial development is a precondition of the eradication of unemployment and poverty from the uh, from the for the country and this is uh, both are true but so the the r is not explaining a so answer is b so fifth question set 3 answer is b and which one of the following soils develop in an area with high temperature the same question about soils and two spells of heavy rainfall and heavy temperature the answer is d laterite soils so, so session th set 3 question number 6 answer is d and set 3 question number 7 the photograph is given and this photograph is about lakshminath bej barwa is an assamese literary person and the next question question number 8 and one more so visually impaired persons there is a question given in question number 7 so who among the following is the writer of gulam giri so jyotiba phule is the writer of gulam giri question number 8 in which one of the following countries was mass production was done in 19th century or 1920s early 19th century united states of america four industry was started and question number 
So set three. So choose the correct option from the following regarding central powers in First World War: Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Ottoman Turkey. Ninth question, answer A. And tenth question, the answer is B. Liberal conservatism after Napoleon, eighteen hundred and fifteen, Congress of Vienna, rooted towards conservatism. Tenth question, answer B. Eleventh question, which one of the following is a challenge of globalization? And here the challenge for the globalization in the given options, D is the right option, the disproportionate growth for the economies and all the economies are fighting for the fairer globalization. And question number 12, which one of the following categories of the urban households take highest percentage of so loans from the formal sector that is answer D. Rich households, 90% of the loans are taken up by these people from the formal sector in urban areas, rich, uh, rich households. And 13th question, which one of the following is the modern forms of currency? Paper notes is the modern forms of currency. 13th question, answer A. 14th question, the uh, one of the following feature of unorganized sector. So there are rules and regulations, but so they are not followed in unorganized sector. So question number 14, D is the right answer. And 15th question, natural products being changed into other forms is known as is a secondary sector natural products they take and they make a process and manufacturing and they change the product uh, to the final end, isn't it? So this is secondary second or secondary product. 15th question answer B. And 16th question, so based on the 2019 neighboring countries of India and some kind of analysis of HDI given in which which country is a leading country in HDI is Sri Lanka as per 73rd rank, the least rank and the best rank out of all the neighboring countries of India. So answer is C, Sri Lanka. Question number 16, answer C. 17th question, choose the correct options to fill in the blanks. For comparison of the countries, right, there's dash is considered by the World Bank income of the countries, you know, per capita income. So income of the country is the most important. It's not expenditure or it's not education, living standard, health status. All the other three comes under HDI, but only income comes under World Bank. It's classification of high income, middle income and low income countries. So 17th question, the answer is B. And question number 18, which one of the following countries adopted multi-party system? So USA, India, China, United Kingdom, multi-party system adopted by India in the given options. So 18th question, answer is B. 19th question, which, which one of the following states is ruled by regional party? So here the options, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Odisha, right here, A, B, C, D out of that C, Odisha is Biju Janata Dal is a leading regional party for long years, more than 15 years. And 20th question, in which one of the following regions is the participation of women in public life in is highest? The Nordic countries. So you could, you understood now clearly that the first question in the previous set what we discussed so is a so 20th question in this understand yes or no so then so i believe and i analyzed and i checked very clearly that so all the three sets what we have here with the same questions there is no difference of questions even so generally we believe that board so brings few questions change in questions like 10 to 15 percent some very questions they change but the most of the questions discussed in the most three sets, except for one or two questions in some of the sets, are different. But more, maximum 95-97% of the questions are so very same questions in a jumbled manner. That is the reason. The first set, what is that we have extensively, very, very clearly, point to point we explained. Uh, that is the reason. So today I end up this session of explanation of these three sets. If you still you want something explanation, so you can post. So you can post in the live sessions where so definitely we consider and we we explain those questions even. So thank you students for having so wonderful uh, yes uh, link here that so you I believe you enjoy all the question answers right and all the accu accuracy of answers at every level and so greater explanations for every question. Thank you all, thank you. So good evening to you all.